in the last section, we were able to finally test out our application inside of a web browser. So this is awesome. We're now ready to start thinking about how we're going to deploy this application off to AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Let's first begin with a quick review of how we deployed our single container setup. So we were pushing our code to GitHub. We then set up Travis CI to automatically pull in our repository. Travis built an image out of all of our code. So it ran the actual Docker build command. It then used the built image to test out our code base specifically by running that npm run test command. Travis then pushed all of our code to Elastic Beanstalk through the use of that deployment script. And then finally, once the code showed up over on Elastic Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk took all of our code, built the image again, and deployed it to a running web server. So as we said at the start of all this multi-container stuff, having Elastic Beanstalk build our images was probably not a very good approach because we were building everything out far more often than it had to be. And we were also relying upon a running web server to have to download a bunch of dependencies and build an image for us, which kind of kept it from doing its primary job of serving web requests. So this time around, we're gonna use a slightly different deployment flow. Although in general, most of these pieces are gonna look very similar. All right, so here's what we're gonna do for our multi-container setup. We're still going to be using a primarily Travis CI driven deployment flow. So all you are gonna to have to do is deploy your code to GitHub, then Travis CI will pull your code down and immediately start to run some build process on it. So we push to GitHub, Travis pulls down your repo. We're going to have Travis then build a test image, or in other words, it's going to build out that kind of React test image that we made just to test the React code inside of our project. As soon as that React test image is made, we're going to essentially throw away everything inside that image. So again, the image is only being made for testing purposes. After the test successfully run and we decide to go ahead and deploy our application, we're then going to make Travis in charge of building our production images. So Travis is going to run a production build script or essentially build a production image using Docker files that we've placed inside of our project for each of our different services for the client, Nginx, server, and worker. Once Travis has built those images, and remember, these are image files, so they are single files, we're then gonna have Travis push them off to the Docker Hub service. Now let's take a quick pause right there. At this point, we've been making use of Docker Hub throughout this entire course. And remember, you can get there by going to hub.docker.com. Every time that we've come here, we've always looked at the dashboard or explore tab up here and looked at some official repositories. Again, these are public repositories that everyone has access to. But in addition to those public repositories, you can also have repos that belong specifically to you and only contain your code, your own personal projects. So Docker Hub is not only for hosting kind of common community packages or community images, it can also be used to host your personal projects as well. So we're gonna have Travis build these images and then push them up to your personal Docker Hub account. Docker Hub is kind of like a universal hub for Docker images. A tremendous number of deployment services out there, such as Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, or really all Amazon services and all Google Cloud services are all wired up natively to automatically pull images that are stored on Docker Hub. So if you and I push our production images to Docker Hub, we can then easily get Elastic Beanstalk to download those images and use them as a basis for deploying our application. So in short, after pushing up the built production images to Docker Hub, Travis is then going to essentially push a little message over to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. Rather than pushing over the entire project and saying, oh, hey, it's time to like build some images, Travis is just going to kind of tap Elastic Beanstalk on the shoulder and say, hey, I just deployed a new set of images up to Docker Hub. You should probably make use of them. And so at that point, Elastic Beanstalk is going to download those images. It doesn't have to build them. They've already been built. It'll download the images and it'll use them as the basis for a brand new deployment. So the benefit to this entire setup is that we are no longer going to be dependent upon Elastic Beanstalk to build our images. Everything is going to be done by Travis and it's only going to be done one time. We then are gonna push these images up to Docker Hub. And once they're on Docker Hub, we essentially can deploy 
anywhere you can possibly imagine. Like I said, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud and many other providers are set up out of the box to automatically download images from Docker Hub specifically without a whole bunch of additional configuration. And so we really consider Docker Hub to be like a central repository for everything in the Docker world. All right, so now that we've got the idea of what we're going to do here, let's take a quick pause and we'll continue in the next section by starting to build out our Travis.yaml file. And we'll also start to make some production versions of our Docker files for each of our different services. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about the new deployment practice that we're going to use for this multi-container deployment. Again, the big change this time around is that we're going to use Travis CI to build our images and then push them to Docker Hub. So now Elastic Beanstalk will not have to do any build process for us. And the first thing we need to do as part of this process is to make sure that we have production versions of all of our different Docker files. As a reminder, all of our different services currently have dockerfile.dev files. These are Docker files specifically made to get our projects set up in a development environment. And in some cases, we need to customize them to get them a little bit more ready for a production style deployment. So we're gonna first begin with our worker process. Inside of my worker directory, I'll make a new Docker file file. Boy, that's a tongue twister. Inside of here, we're gonna put in a series of instructions to get a production version of this worker application put together. Now, here's kind of the interesting thing. I want you to open up the dockerfile.dev version right now. Inside of here, you'll see this very familiar configuration that we've used many times around. So I'll be honest with you, we don't actually have to make a darn change in here for the production version of this Docker file. All the production version has to do is get our NPM modules installed and then run some setup or startup command. And that's essentially exactly what our existing Docker file does. So rather than trying to write an entire new Docker file from scratch, I'm gonna take everything inside of the dev file, I'm gonna copy it, and then I'll paste it over into the new production Docker file right here. So we're going to still do all the same steps. We're gonna use Node Alpine as a base image, set up a working directory, copy over the package.json file, install some dependencies, copy over all of our other files inside of our project directory, and then run some startup command. So the only thing that's going to be different inside of our production Docker file is in fact the startup command. Rather than starting up with npm run dev, we're going to make a npm run start command instead. So traditionally npm run dev is used as you might guess for the development environment. Usually when we move to a production environment, we change this to start because you might have a slightly different command. Now, as a reminder, these npm run scripts that we're putting together right here, they are not just created for us by magic. These are actual scripts that you and I define inside of our package.json file. So I'm going to open up the package.json file and just verify that we do in fact have a start script. And in fact, we do. And this definitely is appropriate or good enough really for starting up our application in a production environment. So I think that's pretty much it for our Docker file for the worker. We just used everything the same as the development version. We just did a little bit of a customization for the npm run start command. Let's now go through the same process for the server service as well. Inside my server directory, I'll make a new file called docker file. And again, I'm going to open up my dockerfile.dev. I'll copy everything inside of here. And then I'll paste it inside of the new docker file. Again, we don't really have to do any customization here. Sometimes in some projects, like for example, as we saw with the create react app example, sometimes we do want a difference between our production Docker file and the development one, but sometimes it's just not necessary. There's really nothing different that we need to do. Nonetheless, I do still recommend that you have different Docker files because you might want to make a small change or two. And I guess in this case, we are changing the default startup command. So it is a little bit different. All right, so again, I'm going to find my initial command right here. Rather than running npm run dev, which is usually used for development purposes, I'll do npm run start instead. Now, if I open up my package.json file, I can just verify that I do in fact have a start script. Yep, I do. And so I'll save the production Docker file. And again, I think we're all good to go. Now we'll do just one more inside this section. We'll do the Nginx as well. 
Again, it's the same story. We're not making any changes with the production Docker file. So I'll make the Docker file, I'll open up the development version, and we're going to use the exact same thing this time around. So we're going to copy over the default.conf file because it has all of our routing rules, and that's going to be overriding the default default or default.conf file that exists inside the Nginx image. Again, no changes. Now, in this case, I will say this is probably the one location where we might want to make a little change to the Docker file. I'm not going to because it's not strictly necessary. I'm just going to throw this out as a possible example. You'll recall that just one or two sections ago, inside of the default.conf file, we added on one of those routing rules right here. This was to allow WebSockets to connect to that specific endpoint on our React.js development server. And so this right here was really a development specific piece of configuration. And so if we were really doing a super, super production version, you know, again, for a, this course, I'm, I'm trying to make things as production realistic as possible, but this is one location where it's just really not a big deal at all. If we really wanted to have a separate production version, I might make a separate default.conf file that would not have this WebSocket block inside of it. So if you wanted to, you could absolutely do that. But for right now, having a production Docker file that just uses the same default.conf is good enough. It is definitely good enough. There's not a huge reason to make any changes. All right, so that are, those are our production Docker files for the worker, server, and Nginx services. Let's take a quick pause and we'll tackle the client in the next section. In the last section, we started putting together production versions of our Docker files for Nginx, server, and worker. We're now gonna start to move forward to our client project. Now, we're going to be writing a production Docker file for a React project right here. As you might recall, we already did this during our single container deployment section many, many videos ago. I took the liberty of opening up the Docker file from that project. Well, I'm going to pull it on the screen here really quickly. So again, this is the production Docker file for the single container deployment that we worked on before, specifically tailored to a React type application. Although to be honest, we could have used it just as well with any other front end framework. This was a multi-stage deployment where we first started with a node image. We installed all of our dependencies and then ran npm run build to build production versions of all of our assets. We then started up a second layer right here, or a second phase of the build process, where we started from Nginx. We opened up port 80, and then we copied over the production version of all of our assets into that image. So that's what we did before on this single container deployment. Now things this time around are gonna be just very slightly different than what we had back then. So here's a diagram of the single container deployment. We had the Nginx with production, versions of our React files inside of it, and that was all running on an Elastic Beanstalk instance. Anytime a browser made a request to Elastic Beanstalk, Nginx automatically responded on port 80 with the production version of those React files. Now, I wanna give you a quick reminder of how our architecture is a little bit different this time around with our multi-container setup, specifically in the development environment. So this time on this project, a browser will make a request into the initial Nginx server. And this Nginx server right here, this is specifically responsible for routing and making sure that requests get to the correct backend. When a request goes off to get our production, or excuse me, our React assets, a request is made or forwarded onto port 3000 on the React server. Now, when we move into production, we have to take that port 3000 right there into account. So this time around, we're still going to have a Nginx server that is solely dedicated to serving up our production React files. But this time around, rather than listening on port 80 and being like the first jump inside of the Elastic Beanstalk instance, it's going to be listening on port 3000. And users are only going to be able to access this Nginx server with, right here with all of our production files by first going through the other copy of Nginx that is specifically responsible for, again, routing. So between the previous version of this React front-end Docker file and all this kind of productionizing of the React project, before we will, were 100% concerned with port 80, this time around, we need to do a little bit of configuration of the Nginx server to make sure that it instead listens on port 3000 and still exposes all the React production assets 
on port 3000 instead. Now, quick question you might have. You might be curious, Steven, we've got two copies of Nginx right here. Could we instead just like make use of one copy? Like maybe just have a single copy of Nginx that listens on port 80 and both serves up production React files and does routing to our backend services. You know, in this case, we'd only have the Express server, but we could very easily have other services back here as well. The answer to that is yes. We could absolutely collapse this down to just use one single Nginx server. However, there are definite reasons that you might want to run multiple copies of Nginx. The easiest reason for that might be maybe to serve up our production React files over here. Maybe we were not running Nginx. Maybe it was a much more, sis, much more simplistic file system data store. And so there was no Nginx there, and it was just like flat files that were being served for whatever crazy reason. So if that was the case, we would still need to have the Nginx server out here and still have it route traffic looking for our production assets to some specific port where users could get our production files. So it just happens that in our example right now, we are using Nginx for both of these servers. It could be very well possible that we are using different services for the two. And because of that, I wanna give you the more like complete complicated example here to get you a little bit more ready for real world production deployments where you might have one container responsible for routing and a different container entirely responsible for serving up your front end assets. So yes, we could condense the two down to just one Nginx server, but we're gonna leave it as two separate servers just to give you a little bit more complex example that transitions to the real world a little bit more nicely. Okay, so a lot of talking. At the end of the day, all I'm really trying to say here is when we build our production Docker file for the React app, we need to customize Nginx to make sure that it listens on port 3000. And that's pretty much it. So with that in mind, let's take a quick pause. We're gonna come back to the next section. We're gonna start working on the Docker file for our client project. So I'll see you in just a moment. In the last section, we spoke about how we need to set up a little bit different Docker file for the client project this time around, just because we need to customize the way in which Nginx, Nginx behaves. And specifically, we want to make sure that it listens on port 3000. So to get this working, we're gonna find our client project. And we're gonna first write out a little configuration file specifically for that Nginx server. So for the Nginx server, I'm gonna make a new file inside of the client project, and I'm gonna call it Nginx. And then inside there, we'll make a new file called default.conf. We don't specifically have to make the nested folder here. I just thought that it would be really clear that, oh, inside the Nginx folder are files that are related to the Nginx server that hosts the client project. So now inside of here, we're gonna put down a little bit of configuration that looks very similar to some of the configuration we put together on the Nginx project previously. So I'll say server is going to listen on port 3000. So as you might imagine, that's kind of the magic sauce right there. That's gonna make sure that Nginx listens on port 3000 and serves up the React production files from there instead of the default of port 80. And then on here, we're all, we are also gonna set up a routing rule. So we're gonna say anytime someone comes to the root route, we're going to set a root of user share Nginx HTML. And as you'll recall, that's where we're going to put all of our production assets We'll also set up an, excuse me, an index directive, and we'll say that it's going to be our index.html or index.htm files, like so. Okay, so that's all we have to do for the default Nginx configuration. So we can now close this file, and then inside the client directory, we'll make a new file that's going to be the production version of our Docker file. So for the React application, our Docker file will look very similar to what we had previously. We're still gonna do the multi-step build process, but this time around, right before we set up this kind of custom copy from the builder step, we're also gonna make sure that we copy over that default.conf file that we just put together as well. And that's going to be responsible for changing the configuration of the Nginx server. So inside this Docker file, we're going to set up the first step of our multi-step build process. We'll say from node Alpine, and we'll call this step builder. We'll set up a work directory of slash app. We'll copy over the package.json file to that working directory. 
we will run npm install, and then we'll copy over everything else. And then finally, we'll set up the actual build process, the step that actually builds the production version of our front end assets by running the command npm run build. So that the output from that will be a folder inside of that app directory called build. That's where all the production assets get placed. So we then want to copy that folder over to the Nginx phase of our build. So I'll make a sec second phase here. I'll say from Nginx, we're going to expose port 3000 this time around. I will copy over the Nginx default.conf file. So copy Nginx default.conf. Oh, let's make sure we say current working directory. And I want to copy that into etsy nginx conf.d, and we're going to overwrite the existing default.conf file. And then finally, we're going to make sure that we also copy over all the production build assets from the builder phase. We'll say copy dash dash from builder, give me app slash build. Again, that's the default location, the build folder for all the production version of those assets. And we're going to copy those into the user share nginx HTML directory. Okay, that's pretty much it. So again, the entire reason that we changed things around this time was that this time our nginx server has to listen on port 3000. That's why we added on that default.com file, just to change the default port that nginx listens on. We also set up a special rule on there to make sure that our production assets get shared out of there as well. Okay, so I think that we're just about ready to go here. So I'm gonna make sure I save this file and we'll continue in the next section. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. There's one last little thing that we need to do to prepare the client project before we attempt to deploy it off. Inside the client SRC directory, you'll find the app.test.js file. This is a very simple little test that tries to assert that we can render out the app component without anything crashing during the process. Now, unfortunately, if we ran this test suite right now, we probably would see a crash. And the reason that we would see the crash is that the app component now attempts to render out the fib component. And the fib component is going to try to make a request to our backend express server that is not quite running at this point in time. So just to make sure that our test runs successfully, I'm going to delete the three lines of tests in there, and then I'll simply save the file. If we were running a real test suite right here, rather than making a request off to the real Express API, what we'd probably do is set up a little faker module to kind of mock out that request and return some dummy JSON very quickly. So now that we've made this change, we've got a test suite that we know is going to pass 100% of the time. Let's take a quick pause right here, and we'll continue in the next section. Now that we've got production versions of all of our sub projects put together, we're now going to create a new Git repository. We're gonna create a new GitHub repository and we're gonna link it all up to Travis CI. We'll then start to write a Travis.yaml file and we're gonna make sure that that Travis.yaml file has all these steps of making sure that we test our image, we build a production version of the images and so on. So to get started, I'm gonna first change on over to my terminal. I'm inside of my complex directory Inside of here, we're going to make a new Git repository that we're going to eventually push up to GitHub. So I will run git init, that will create the repository. I'll then add in all of my code with git add dot, and then I will commit everything with git commit, initial commit, like so. And I hit enter there very quickly, that's what the command was. I apologize for hitting that too early. All right, so that created our Git repository. We now need to go create a repo on github.com and link it up to Travis CI. So I'm going to flip over to my browser and navigate to github.com. Once here, I'll find the little plus button on the top right hand side and click on new repository. We then get prompted to enter in a repo name. So for this project, I'm going to use a repository name of multi-docker like so, because this is a multi-container deployment using Docker. I'm gonna make sure that I mark the repo as public, and then I'll click Create Repository at the bottom. 
Now remember, we have one last step to do. We need to wire up GitHub as a remote for our repository. So I'll click on the copy link right here to get the remote. I'll then go back over to my terminal and I'll set up a new remote by running git remote add origin and then I'll paste in that link that I just copied. We can then do a git remote dash v and that will list off our current remotes. Right now it's just origin. So we can now push our code up there by running git push origin master. And that's going to push all of our code up to GitHub. We can now go back over to the browser, refresh the page, and there we go, all of our code appears. So now the next thing we need to do is create a link between GitHub and Travis CI. We need to make sure that we enable this repository right here and have Travis CI attempt to build the code that we placed inside of here. So inside of a new browser tab, I'm going to navigate to travis-ci.org. We're going to go up to the top right-hand side and find profile. And because we just created that new repo like two seconds ago, I'm going to make sure that I click on sync account right here on the left-hand side. So that's going to reach out to GitHub and get a updated list of all of our different repositories. Now this step might take a second or two. I'll give it like five seconds and then I'll pause the video. Okay, I'm gonna pause the video right here and we'll continue in the next section. We're gonna make sure that we enable Travis CI. Okay, never mind, it's done. All right, we're just gonna keep going. <laughs> All right, we'll refresh the page to make sure that new repo shows up on the list right here. And then we'll do a search for Docker and we should see the multi Docker project or repo that we just created up here. And so again, all we have to do is click on the little slide right there to enable it as a built project. So now we can go back over to the Travis CI dashboard and we should see the new entry over here. Now Travis CI is going to probably attempt to pull this repo in just a minute or two and run it as a build. But of course we don't have a Travis.yaml file inside of it yet. So Travis might show an error and say, hey, I don't know what to do, which is totally fine. So let's take a pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and we're gonna start working on the Travis.yaml file. In the last section, we put together the production version of our Docker file for the client project. Now that we've got production versions and we've essentially productionized, I guess is the best term, all these sub projects, we're not gonna to start to work on the Travis.yaml file, which is going to instruct Travis on exactly how to handle our build when we push our code up to GitHub. I put together a couple of steps of what we're going to do inside the Travis file. Now, in general, all the configuration that's going to go inside of here is going to look very similar to the last Travis.yaml file we put together. So at the top of the Travis.yaml file, we're going to specify Docker as a dependency. We're then going to build a test version of the React project, because remember, part of the entire purpose of Travis CI is to run some number of tests. So we're going to build out the React project using the development Docker file because only the development Docker file has all the source code required for running our tests. We'll run the tests, and then as long as the tests are successful, we'll build production versions of all the sub projects, we'll push them off to Docker Hub, and then we'll tell Elastic Beanstalk to update. Now, quick reminder, we have not yet created an instance of Elastic Beanstalk. So at this point, we're just gonna do kind of like half of the Travis.yaml file, and then we're going to flip over to Elastic Beanstalk and make sure that we have an environment ready for us. Now, one other quick thing I wanna mention here, this quick note, we are only going to be running tests around the React project. If you had other tests for say the server or the worker projects, we could very easily expand the Travis.yaml file to build out the test versions of images for the server and the worker and run tests inside of those images or those containers at the same time as well. So even though we're only doing tests for the React project, it would be very easy, very straightforward to add in other test suites to this entire process as well. Okay, so with all this in mind, let's get to it. I'll flip back over to my code editor. Inside of my root project directory, I'll make a new file called .travis.yml. Again, remember we have a leading dot on here. Please don't forget the leading dot. And then inside of here, we'll put down a little bit of configuration that looks very similar to what we did previously. So I'll say sudo is required. For services, we want to get access to a copy of Docker. 
And then as a before install step, we're going to build a test version of our client project and then eventually run some tests inside of it. So remember to build out a test version of the client project, we'll make an image out of the dockerfile.dev file. Again, we're making use of the development Docker file here because we only get access to all these test suites and all that kind of good stuff when we have all of the dependencies attached to the project. The production Docker file installs dependencies, builds a production version of the project, and then copies over just the very raw production version of our assets. And so that's why we're not going to use the production Docker file. Production Docker file does not allow us to run any tests. Okay, so we'll say dash docker build we'll tag the image with your docker id and then some name for this image i'll call it react test that works just fine and now this time around we do have to specify or override the default docker file so i'll say dash f and now this time remember our travis.yaml file is in the root project directory but we want to specify a docker file that exists inside the client directory so we have to provide a relative path to the client dockerfile.dev file. So I will say dash f dot slash client dockerfile.dev, like so. And I'll zoom out just so you can see that whole line. And then after that, we still need to also specify the build context, or essentially where all of our project files for the image can be found. We've always been doing dot before because we always wanted to use the current working directory as essentially the build context. But again, this time around, we want to specify this nested folder of client as our build context. So rather than just specifying dot as the build context, I'll say dot slash client, which means look into the client directory to get the build context. Okay, so that's it for the before install step. So after we build out that image, we then need to use it to run a couple of tests. So I'll specify the script section. Remember the script section is the primary test running section. If any of the scripts that we add inside of here exit with a status code other than zero, then Travis CI is going to assume that our build failed. So if you had other, like I just said a moment ago, if you had other projects or other sub projects or images in here that you wanted to run tests for, you could add in an additional build install script right here to essentially docker build my other project. And then on the script section, you would do a docker run my other project, and then you would override the default startup command with run my tests or whatever it might be. Again, you can add in as many scripts right here as you want to for running your test suites. But in our case, we want to run a very specific script. We want to do docker run. We want to use the image that we just created so it will be your Docker ID slash react test. And then we will override the default startup command with npm test. And remember how by default npm test enters watch mode, which means it's never going to exit. And so we're going to make sure that this thing eventually exits by adding on dash dash space dash dash coverage like so. So that's going to make sure that the test script eventually exits with a status code of either zero or not zero if the test failed. Okay, so this looks pretty good. So after we run the script and after everything passes successfully, we'll then add on a after success block right here. Inside of the after success block, we're gonna to start to add in the configuration that's going to build production version of all of our projects and then push them off to Docker Hub. So let's first begin by doing the production version of each of our different sub projects in here. So we need to do a Docker build for the client, Nginx, server, and worker folders. So I will do a Docker build dash T, Steven Ryder, and then we're going to give a very real image name to this one. So as my image names, I'm gonna use kind of a consistent scheme here. I'm going to call each of these multi and then the name of the project. So like multi dash client. I'm using the word multi right here just because this is a multi-container project. In general, you can call the image whatever you want for the repository name, 
But again, I'm going to use multi dash and then the name of the sub project over here just to stay a little bit consistent. And then as the build context, I'll make sure that I pass in client like so. Now this time around, we do not have to specify the Docker file because it can use the default Docker file of simply Docker file right there. Now we're going to repeat the same process for all the other directories as well. So I'll do a docker build dash t Steven Greider multi nginx dot slash nginx. I'll do a docker build multi server with dot slash server and then a docker build dash t a Steven Greider multi worker with the worker folder like so. So again, this is going to go through each of these subfolders and build images using the production Docker file for each one. So after we build these production version of the images, we then have to push them all off to Docker Hub. So at this point, we've kind of gone for a long time. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to add on a little bit more code to make sure that we push off everything to Docker Hub, and then we'll be just about set. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our Travis.yml file and built out some production versions of each of our sub-projects. So now that we've built out these production versions, we now need to add in an additional step down here to take those images and push them to Docker Hub. Now, in order to push an image to Docker Hub, we need to first log in to the Docker CLI. You and I actually logged into the Docker CLI in this course way, way long ago when we first installed Docker. You might recall that after installing Docker, we ran Docker login, and then we entered in our Docker ID and our password. That associated our Docker client right here with our Docker Hub account. And so if you and I pushed any images up to Docker Hub, they would be automatically associated with your account or my account. So we need to make sure that we do the exact same thing inside of our Travis.yaml script. Before we can attempt to push those off to Docker Hub, we need to first log in to the Docker CLI. And so essentially we need to run the Docker login command right here and then enter in our username and our password. Now, of course, we're not gonna put our password or the username as plain text inside of our Travis.yaml file because then other people could very easily see that information. So instead, very similar to what we did on our last Travis CI project, we're gonna set up some encrypted environment variables that are only accessible by Travis CI. And we'll add in our username and password over there. So to get started, I'm gonna flip back over to my Travis project. Make sure that you're looking at the new repository or the new project that we just put together. So you should see multi Docker right here as the repo name or whatever it is that you called it. Then to enter in our Docker ID and our password, we'll go to more options on the right hand side and find settings. We'll then scroll down a little bit and find the environment variables section. So for the environment variables, we're going to enter in our Docker ID and our Docker password. So I will set the first one up with the name of Docker underscore ID, and then I will enter in my Docker ID which is Steven Greider. Of course, you'll want to customize it for your Docker ID in particular. And I'll add that as a variable. I'll then set up a second of Docker underscore password. And then here I'm going to enter in my password. Now, not that I don't trust you or anything, but I'm not going to show you my Docker password. I'm going to enter it in on a second screen very quickly and add it as an additional variable. There we go. So I've now got my two environment variables for the Docker ID and the Docker password. So now we'll go back over to our Travis.yml file. And we're going to add in a script line right here that's going to log us into the Docker CLI. And then once we're logged in, we'll then be able to push all of our images off to Docker Hub. Now to log into the Docker CLI, we're going to execute a command here that's just a little bit more intense or complicated than the Docker login we executed over here. Remember, inside of our terminal, we had ran Docker login, and then we got two little prompts that said, hey, enter your ID and enter your password. Now, unfortunately, on Travis, Travis doesn't really have support for a prompt like that or a wizard like that of sorts. So we're going to enter in a little bit more complicated version of the Docker login command. 
let's just write out the code or the configuration, excuse me, the command that we'll need to log in, and we'll talk about what it's doing. So I'm going to say echo, double quotes, dollar sign, docker, password. Then after that, I'll put in a pipe. So that is shift and then the character to the right above the enter or return key on your keyboard. And then we'll say docker login dash u. And I'm going to collapse my sidebar so you can see everything here. We'll do another set of double quotes. Inside there, we'll do dollar sign docker underscore ID. I'm going to make sure that's the actual variable name I used. Yep, it was. We'll then close off the double quotes and then put in dash dash password dash standard in or STDIN, like so. All right, so what's this do? Well, essentially, again, we don't want to have to go through the kind of little multi step wizard that Docker login usually presents you with. Instead, we want to just do the entire login step in one single command. So the first part of this, echo docker password, is going to retrieve your docker password from the environment variable, and then essentially emit that over standard in as input to the next command, or essentially the command on the other side of the pipe right here. So you can kind of imagine that your password is taken and added in to the standard in channel for this command right here. We then run the docker login command, and add in your username as a dash u flag. And then we tell Docker login that it can expect to receive that password over standard in. So essentially, this is how we log into Docker in one single command. Okay, so that's it. Now that we've logged into the Docker CLI, we can now take all of our built images and push them off to Docker Hub. So to push the images off, I'll put in dash Docker push. And then all we do is list out the tag. So we'll list out four separate Docker push commands, one for each of these different tags that we have. So I want to push the image with the tag of Steven Greider slash multi-client. I want to push Steven Greider multi-nginx. I bet you can guess the next one, multi-server. And of course, multi-worker, like so. All right, so that's all we got to do. As you might imagine, running Docker push and pushing your image up right here is just as easy as pushing your code up to GitHub. Once you've done the kind of legwork of building the image and locking into, or excuse me, logging into Docker login, all you got to say is Docker push, and then the name of the image that you want to push up to Docker Hub, and Docker takes it from there. So last thing we need to do is test out this entire script and make sure that we can successfully push images off to Docker Hub. So I'm going to flip back over to my command line. We need to issue a new GitHub commit here and push it up to GitHub, or excuse me, a new Git commit and issue it up to GitHub to get Travis to run our project and attempt to build these images for the very first time. So inside the complex directory, I'll do a git status and verify that, yep, we made a change to the Travis.yaml file. I will add that change with git add dot. I'll commit it with git commit dash m, change Travis. YAML, and then I will push it up to origin master, like so. So now in a moment or two, we should see our Travis build come to life and attempt to build and then push our images off to Docker Hub. So I'm gonna pause the video right now. I'm gonna wait about five or 10 minutes for that entire process to be completed, and then we'll come back together in the next section and make sure that all of our images were successfully saved to Docker Hub. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we finished up a couple of changes to our Travis YAML file and then pushed those changes up to GitHub. Once we pushed the changes up, Travis CI automatically woke up, pulled down our files, and ran the directions we added to the Travis C YAML file. It looks like the build was successful, but let's take a look at some of the output and just see what happened. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that Docker, excuse me, Travis successfully built our image using the client directory and then ran some tests using that image. All the tests ran successfully, and after they did, we then attempted to build our four different images using the production Docker file in each of those subdirectories. We then successfully logged into the Docker CLI, and then successfully pushed all four images up to Docker Hub. So we can now open up a new browser tab and navigate to Hub 
www.docker.com. And once you go there, you'll see four brand new repositories appear right here. Each of these represents one of those different images that we just pushed up. So we could look at, say, how about multi-nginx right here? And we can look at our tags. And right now, we have just the latest tag. Because remember, by default, whenever we tag an image with a name, the default version used on the very end is latest. So cool, that's pretty much it. We now have a rock solid process to take our GitHub repository and build Docker images out of each of those sub projects and then push them up to Docker Hub. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna continue in the next section and start thinking about deploying this app over to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute.